All right, lesson number two, July 9, 1904. Why, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? Okay, uh, what did the prophet behold arising out of the sea? And that's in Revelation 13, 1 and 2. Uh, 13, 1. And 2. And I saw upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having he seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him the power and his seat and great authority. All right, tremendous authority. All right, it says... Um, Number three there, how many points of identity can you find between this beast and the little horn of Daniel 7? And it gives a lot of scriptures there. I found it more interesting to find out which ones didn't match. Uh, the ones that did match we can understand because both have the same satanic power beneath them, the dark ages and end times. So the devil uh, used what works. And we find both of these uh, things of the devil's work in Daniel 7 as well as in Revelation 13. But uh, the three horns uh, up by the roots and the eyes like the eyes of a man. Um, it had eyes. It had a mouth that spoke great things. Well, it had a mouth speaking great things in Revelation 13 also. It had a stout look, which Revelation 13 doesn't have. It was diverse from the first, and it subdued three kings. And uh, Revelation 13 overcame them, uh, had made war with the saints. Uh, let's see, they both had time, time and a half times. Okay, they both had ten horns. But uh, the second beast, all the world wonders after the second beast. That didn't happen in Daniel 7. It only happens in Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, they worship both the dragon and the beast. They didn't do that in Daniel 7. I probably noticed that. Uh, no one would make war with him in Revelation 13. He made war with others, but the others didn't make war with him. Let's see. Oh, he blasphemes the temple in Revelation 13. He doesn't do that in Daniel 7. And uh, those who dwell in heaven are blasphemed by him in Revelation 13. They are not in Daniel 7. And then it says, Power over all kindreds, tongues, nations, and all who dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not in the book of life. It doesn't say anything about all the world doing anything in Daniel 7. So these differences are pretty obvious. But uh, Revelation 13 is getting more toward the end time, time of the end, the second rise of the papacy. So it does have a lot of similarities. Satan's still there. But it also is a more grandiose persecution. Uh, it is a timed persecution, as was the first and it has power over all of the nations of the world, which Daniel 7's beast did not. So we have these basic differences, as well as similarities. Uh, how many worship him in Revelation 13, 8? Okay, Max has that one. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life. Uh -huh. of the Lamb. 
So there's a distinction made. Those that are, have your names written in the back of life and those who do not. Some are careless and don't just grab it all until it's too late. And others never accept the whole truth anyway. Uh, but then there are those who do. All right, all whose names are not in the book of life shall worship him. So there's just those two divisions, those whose names are and those whose names are not. It doesn't say Seventh-day Adventists and Baptists or Mormons and Presbyterians. It doesn't say any of this. It says, no, the difference is whether your name's there or not. With what words do the people worship the beast? And what else do they worship? Revelation 13:4. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able, able to make, make war, war with him? All right. And then the question is phrased so that there isn't anybody that can make war with him. Uh, can you think, as an example, take a look at the Vatican. Do you think anybody would make war with that little city state run by the Pope? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, they'd have a lot of nations on their backs if they tried it. Um, okay. <sighs> Who will make war with him? All right, so we have both the dragon and the beast being worshipped here in Revelation 13. That does not happen in Daniel 7. Um, but it certainly happens down here. So they're worshipping the dragon, which is Satan, and they're worshipping the beast power also. All right, who gave to the beast his seat? Yeah, you've been over this so many times. I'd say pagan Rome, wouldn't you? <laughs> Against whom does he speak in Revelation 13, 6? Three, really, I believe. Yeah, three objects. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. All right. So he's blaspheming God. What's blasphemy anyway? What is blasphemy? Uh, oh, here you go. To put themselves above God, which is what Satan wants to do. Okay. He's taking God's place. All right. And using names that does that. Because it says against his name and against his tabernacle in heaven. So um, the tabernacle is brought out here. It was not brought out in Daniel 7. So in the time of the end, uh, one of the focal points of the dragon is going to be get the people who worship according to the temple. But that wasn't so in Daniel 7. It wasn't so in the Dark Ages. But it is here. Um, what then is the professedly Christian power at heart? Well, um, I think we know the answer to that without mentioning it over the air. What does he do to the saints in Revelation 13, 7? And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. And to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Okay, has that ever happened before? Has he ever had authority over all kindreds, tongues, and nations? No. No. He never had power and authority over China. That's a pretty big nation with lots of people. How about the Mohammedans? They were at war with him all through the Dark Ages. <laughs> um, how about India? Tens of thousands of people in India. Did they, uh, did they worship him in the Dark Ages? Mm -mm. No, this is talking about our future when he will rise above all the nations and tongues of the earth. Max? 
they, to some extent, they did under the Jesuit control after in the Counter Reformation, but that was only a foundational thing. That, that's when the Jesuits took on the Thomas and Bartholomew Indians. Yeah, uh, uh, and, Christians and, in there, and the people who but, were involved on the Protestant side of the Reformation certainly yeah. didn't. No. <laughs> okay. How long was the supremacy of the beast as a persecuting power to continue? We have uh, 13, 5, 12, 6, and 14, but I think uh, any one of those will do. <coughs> 13, 5. Mm -hmm. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blas blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. All right, there's 40 in two months. Um, I have a little different take on that, but it also says time, time and a half. Doesn't it? Verse 14, I think it is, time, time and a half. Anyways, um, no, it's not. It's in there someplace, though. 40 in two months, time, time and a half. Um, the time, time and a half is the same as Daniel's, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit as prophetic time. It's a symbol. It doesn't tell you how much time it is. It's time, time and a half. You have to figure out how much that is. That a times is two years, and a time is one year and a half. Time is a half year. You have to figure all that out because it's given in symbolic form. Well, the 42 months aren't. They're not symbolic, and neither is the 1260 days. That's not symbolic either. You can count those. What was in then to occur? Was a wound to be healed? Revelation 3 and 10. John? Yes. Chapter 12, verse 6. Mm -hmm. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what does verse 14 say? I didn't write it down. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Okay, John, I have a reason for saying time, time and a half is symbolic time as it is in Daniel because it represents 1260 years. Nothing about years is said anywhere in the text. There is 1260 days, there is 42 months, and there's this time, time and a half which we interpret to be Dark Ages time, 538 to 1798. I think that's correct. Will this power be permitted to persecute in the last days? Now here James getting pretty excited, or whoever wrote this study. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So that pretty well answers our, our question, doesn't it? And then it adds, if any man have an ear, let him hear. Well, the people in the dark ages have lost theirs. But we still have ours. So this has to be written to us. can't be written to people in the dark ages. They don't have ears anymore. But we do. So I think you can see these projections of end time events throughout this whole thing. Amid the moral darkness, how are the people of God referred to? Verse 10. Well, Revelation 14, 12 has it all, too. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Yes. All right. So they are patient. 
That's something we all have to work on. Here's the patience of the saints. Of course, trials work patience. That's what the Bible says. And tribulation work of patience. It says it that way too. So we're going to have those things that bring about patience. But we're going to be keeping God's commandments anyway. Amen? And we're going to have the faith of Christ. All right. Uh, there are three supportive texts to the time situations in Revelation. And I want to give them to you. The first one is in Revelation 12, 6. And it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Uh, to my limited brain, I would say that's a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Because that's what it says it is. And there's no symbol used. So I look at this as the persecution of the apostles and their associates from 3031 AD to 34, which was the time of tribulation before they went to the Gentiles. In fact, I picked up this news article once <clears throat> uh, back in 1990, I think. Yes, U.S. News and World Report, December 10, 1990. I blew up the caption under their picture of uh, St. Paul so you could see it better. As a Jewish Pharisee with Roman citizenship, Paul persecuted Christians in Palestine before his own dramatic conversion in about AD 34. So when the persecution started, there was the Apostle Paul, and he was still in it three and a half years later when he was converted and went to the Gentiles. And I think that's what this is talking about. Then we have the second thought, the second text regarding persecution from Revelation 12, verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Well, what's the eagle doing there? See, that's symbolic. That she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, time, and a half time. Symbolic language, symbolic bird from the face of the serpent. So I think this is the same time, time, and dividing of time that's in Daniel 7, the Dark Ages, 538 to 1798. John. John. By the way, this is eight verses after the 1260 days in verse 6. There's a lot of stuff that went in between that 1260 days and this time, time and a half. Okay. John. John? John. Can we go back for just a moment? I have a question. Okay. And I have some thoughts. On, uh, on the verse where it talks about having the faith of Jesus, mm -hmm. our Bible commentary has changed that to faith in Jesus. And I've been playing with the idea that what that actually means, and I'd like your input on this, is not having faith in Jesus, but having the faith of Jesus the way it is written, and that we will actually, the 144,000 will imitate uh, Christ while they're here on earth. What are your thoughts? I think you're right. I have no problem with that at all. But it also points out we're looking at last end time events. So let's continue on a little bit. And I mentioned this uh, time, time and a half is eight verses away from that first 1260 days, and a lot of stuff takes place in between there. <coughs> we studied Revelation 12, so I'm going to continue on. A professor Lamanca, University of Rome, to the accession of the Caesars, came to the succession of the pontiffs to Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. So we know the location. Stanley's history, the popes filled the place of the vacant emperors at Rome inheriting their power, prestige, and titles from paganism. <coughs> Excuse me. The church is but the ghosts of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon its grave. So we know about its location. And let's move on a little bit. We don't need these historical quotes today because we live at this end of it. We can look back and see it. The 1260 has long gone. But we still know where the Caesars reigned, and we know who has been there ever since. 
Time, time and a half, 538 to 1798. Here's a new thought to some of you. <coughs> it's the one I use. I think it's more important than the wars. Quote, the Sabbatarian idea, the Sabbath, was expressly repudiated by St. Jerome and condemned by the Council of Orleans in 538. That starts our 1260 days, or time, time and a half. 1260 years later, in 1798, Berthier took the Pope prisoner, Pius VI, and the Seventh-day Baptists began sharing the Sabbath. In fact, they went to Martin Luther with it, and he rejected it. So we have 538 to 1798 when the Sabbath was buried. And you can talk about the wars of that time and all that stuff if you want, that's fine. But I'm looking at the spiritual issues. The third and final text regarding persecution of the saints, Revelation 12:17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, went to make war with the, what? End times, remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 13 that we're studying today tells us who makes war with the end time saints, that is the remnant, for how long? and that he has an accomplice. This is different from Daniel 7. Daniel 7's beast had no accomplice. The time, time and a half, there was no two-horned power to back him up. But I think you can see this two-horned power is now, not then. So we're looking at the now in Revelation 13. It gives the answers, which is what it's for. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And you know all that from past studies. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. In Revelation 13, 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion, the dragon gave him his power, his seat, where is it? <laughs> we know where it is. And great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And then what happens? All the world wondered after the beast. He's looking in, in the perspective of what's going to happen as though it did. But this has never happened before. All the world has never given authority to the beast. But it will. So this puts us in the time frame of today and future. But remember, when our forefathers put these things together in their quarterlies, they didn't have a future. They thought the Lord was coming in their day, so everything had to be in the past. Remember, from here on, we are studying what happens after the deadly wound is healed, which, as you know, began the healing in 1798, but will not be complete until he regains his power of persecution. When he starts persecution again, he has a healed wound. And they worship the dragon, which gave power to the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who's like unto the beast who's able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given him to continue forty and two months. Not time, time and a half, 40 and two months. End time prophecy. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, which Daniel 7 doesn't do, and them that dwell in heaven. So now we know where he is, and we know what his time limit is. All right, Max? It might be worth noting historically that there is at least a model of this in the attempt to uh, reestablish the Holy Roman Empire, which led to World War II. Okay. But starting with Mussolini's restoration of temporal governance to the papacy and, and the Lateran treaties that were finally finalized in 29, on through the uh, 
alliance with the Nazis in the death camps in which the Pope attempted to, to wipe Christianity, uh, non-Catholic Christianity off the face of Europe. So Everything. that's a, at least a, a model of what you're talking about. That's right. Everything was set and ready to go. Uh, but it didn't. And, but that is a definite model. All right, so we know that Satan is involved. That's why you see a lot of the same characteristics as we did Daniel 7 and, and um, 2 Thessalonians 4. But a lot of different ones, too, that can only apply now and in the future. He blasphemed his tabernacle. Is there a church today that has refurbished the teachings of the tabernacle? If you can name such a church, you can see where the persecution is going to end or what they're going after. I may jump ahead in the lesson a little bit, but uh, the second half of this chapter deals with that power and its demand for worship of itself. Yes. The, the image, and uh, it's the General Conference creation, Seventh -day, I mean, the General Conference Seventh day Adventist Church that has refurbished, in case anybody doubts. Very similar. Now we'll take a look at that too, Max. All right, if I don't run out of time. The sins are not location. They're not the seat. They're not the buildings, popes, nor time limits. These are all just clues. Clues to help us see the sins we have to avoid. There are three major sins here. Number one, blasphemy. And the commandments say, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the commandment. There's persecution on its way. And it's written in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not kill. And there's false worship. You've seen the word worship two or three times in the text so far. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Worship him that made heaven, earth, and sea. Is a cry in Revelation 14, the very next chapter. And who made heaven, earth, and sea but the God of the Sabbath? So we have all of this in, in these scriptures. This does not mean that all Rome is bad. But after all, if I were the devil, that's where I'd want to be right now. There is the greatest influence on the religious leaders of the world today. And there is the greatest religious influence on the statesmen of the world today. He doesn't have them all in his little box yet, but they're gaining on, he's gaining on it. We saw a lot of that a couple of weeks ago here in the United States. So if there's religious leaders and there's the statesmen of the world, we have a complete joining of church and state. Things we're not supposed to see, but we are seeing it. This time he gains a partner. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. That's in the second half of our chapter 13. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causes. That is, he forces or he makes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So we have this second power, whom you're well aware of, fraternizing with the beast until he begins to say, worship according to that beast. Now that's the, we're right in between that area today. This is a very timely chapter. And he doeth great wonders, so they make a fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. I'm not sure what that fire is. I... Um, I'm prone to think it's the Holy Spirit fire, the false Holy Spirit fire, the charismatic fire. That's what I, that's what I think it is, but I, I'm not going to put that in concrete until a little more time goes by. Verse 14, and deceiveth. That's Satan's way. We've seen that in the chapter. He's deceptive and he persecutes. Them that dwell on the earth, and he's getting pretty expansive by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. He was wounded, 
But he wasn't dead. They just thought he was. And he came back to life. And so Satan is able to use the same, uh, the same program he did before with added force. Another beast to come along to help him. And he had power to give life under the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as should not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, that's a lot of power that the two-horned beast doesn't have yet. It has the power, just hadn't aimed it at worshipers necessarily. John, may I yes. ask a question? Yeah. In order to be consistent, if the first beast is a church using state power, Mm -hmm. It makes more sense to me that the second beast is a church using state power rather than uh, classic Adventism. I, that's a difference that I have come to. Well, we can go still, there are still two horns involved because there's yeah. truth and religious liberty. Yeah. And so this image could be in place without the United States well, Ellen, having given it its full tilt yet. Yeah, it can. But Ellen I think White, it is. Ellen White lets us know the state will back it. Yeah, that no man might buy or sell. No, no man might buy or sell. That sounds like um, a bargaining chip to me. Isn't that what a trademark's about? Yeah, <laughs> you're jumping ahead of me, but sure it is. But it's the idea that I will not buy your eggs unless you lower the price. That's bargaining power. What country has primarily used that bargaining power? We will not buy your products unless you repair them, unless you have them put together by people who are taken care of in their insurance. We will not buy your products unless you do this, 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 this. That's this. You can't buy or sell unless you do what we want you to do. That's union. Or can be union anyway. So after 6,000 years, we have a remnant that must tread the wine press. What an honor. Some will have red on the borders of their garments. Some will be numbered among the 144,000. But all will be especially honored in heaven. You see the 144,000, a perfect square. You see those who died under persecution with a red ri uh, ribbon of on the edge of their garments. They're honored. But I'm sorry to say that many will fail, forsaking the truth when it becomes an issue. Let's look, at it, let's look at it from what I might call the Ted Schultz point of view. <laughs> we must see the failing side of this issue. It is given in Scripture to help us remain faithful. Even as many of our brethren waffle and many turn against us forsaking the truth. Many are going to waffle. Now we beseech you, brethren. We're going to the Thessalonians now. I'm going to stay there for the rest of the morning. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. He's talking about the second coming of there. That you be not soon shaken in mind. It's not going to happen right away. Or be troubled, neither by spirit, word, letter from us. As, that the day of, as though the day of Christ is at hand. It's not. That's what he's saying by this time. So he adds, let no man deceive you. Who does the deceiving? You see who's working in this? Now he's talking to the brethren. He's talking to the church. He's talking to you and me. Let no man deceive you, church, by any means. For that day of the second coming shall not come except there being a falling away first, church. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Which, by the way, is used, the same word is used for Judas. An inside betrayal. He was in the group. 
who oppose us <coughs> and exalted themselves above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In the temple of God. What is that talking about? Well, in the SCA Bible commentary, it's uh, a church or a worship center. You see, we brethren of Paul in this age don't generally build temples. You wouldn't call this a temple, would you? We wouldn't call the Porterville Church a temple necessarily. You'd call it a church. So I substituted that name church. Well, the SCA Bible commentary does the same thing. It substitutes the word church for temple. So somewhere this character in the end time is going to sit in the religious center. And whoever does that <laughs> sends his messages out to the subordinate churches. That's just the rule. That's just the way it goes. From the main headquarters, <coughs> from the main headquarter church, the word goes out to all subsidiary churches. I would not think this refers to Rome, as Rome is not the temple of God, which this thing is called. He sits in the temple of God. I don't think Rome is a temple of God. There may be others that do, and that's okay with me, but I don't. It's not the temple in Jerusalem, for there's still no temple there. And it would be it be referred to the temple of God. We may be looking at something else here. Something that the brethren of Paul, 2,000 years later, would consider their center of worship where all the rules come from. Let's move on. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. And when is this thing going to come to a climax, Paul? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Where? <laughs> He's talking about in the church. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken away. And when will he be taken out of the way? Well, let's look and see. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's when. So we're, we're going over the same ground in Daniel 7. We're going over the same ground in Revelation 13. Uh, but this more inclines itself to Revelation 13, end time prophecy. It's talking about the period just before the second coming of Christ. Uh, don't listen to me as though Christ were coming now. I, well, I once thought that way. I think we all did. But don't believe that, whether it comes by letter or word or anything else, because there's going to be a falling away before that happens, brethren. Even him, Christ, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, brethren, can you resist the power of Satan, when it's backed up with signs and wonders. He's not going to tell you they're lying wonders, but they will be. And with all deceivableness and righteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the truth. Is that what it says? What does it say? Because they receive not the love of the truth. They had the truth. We've got the truth. You know, that used to be offensive to other denominations, so we've kind of gotten away from it. But I think you've seen other quotes tonight from, from days gone by when we used to call it the truth that we had. This is a group that Paul considers his brethren that at one time had the truth. But in the last days, when Satan uses his greatest power, with convincing signs and lying wonders, they lose their love for it. Doesn't that go right along with Ted Schultz's lecture? He didn't even mention this, but he didn't have to. You think that those who worship before the saints' feet will at last be saved. 
Here I must differ with you. For God showed me that this class were professed Adventists who had what? Fallen away. Fallen away. There will become a falling away before he returns. There they are. Let's move on a little bit. Then I was shown a company howling in agony. On their garments was written in large characters that were weighed in the balance and found wanting. I asked who this company were. The angel said, these were they who have once kept the Sabbath and have given it up. I picked up something this morning in the office that I thought was pretty neat. <coughs> oh my, I only have four minutes left, huh? I saw a number of companies that seemed to be bound together by cords. Many of these companies were in total darkness. But scattered through these different companies were persons whose countenances looked light. Beams of light from Jesus, like rays of the sun, were imparted to them. A glorious light <coughs> then rested down on these companies. I saw a number of companies that seemed to be bound together by cords. Many of these companies were in total darkness, but scattered through these different companies were persons whose countenances looked light and whose eyes were raised to heaven. Beams of light from Jesus, like rays of sun, were imparted to them. A glorious light then rested upon these companies to enlighten all who would receive it. Some of those who were in darkness received the light and rejoiced. Others resisted the light from heaven, saying that it was sent to lead them astray. The light passed away from them and they were left in, left in darkness. Those who had received the light from Jesus joyfully cherished the increase of precious light which was shared up, shed upon them. And their voices were heard in harmony with the voice of the angel, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Those who were in darkness, trusting them with si thrusting them with side and with shoulder. Then many who cherished the sacred light broke the cords which confined them and stood out separate from those companies. These men were constantly saying, God is with us, we stand in the light, we have the truth. I inquired into who those men were and was told that they were ministers and leading men who were rejecting the light themselves and were unwilling that others should receive it. That's from Early Writings 240. Thank you very much. So isn't that interesting? And in the time of the end, <clears throat> special light was coming to God's church, but the leaders would reject it. They've once kept the Sabbath. Maybe eventually they'll give it up too. <laughs> there they go. Not one in 20. What would this mean to many of our churches? <clears throat> Not one in 20. Uh, if only five were left out of 100, that's not one in 20, is it? Five left out of every 100. How many people attend Exeter today? Not, not, not 20 years ago. I'm talking about now. About how many people? About 20. About There's what? about 20 every Sabbath in about, Exeter. About 20. Well, that would leave one. I think Brigetta used to print 125 bulletins when we went there, and they were gone every week. How about Lindsay? How many attend there? A little few more. I've heard that there were only about five people attending in Lindsay. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, the Spanish church is doing quite well. Mm, good for them. How about Porterville? Maybe 150? Maybe. So if one in 20 were saved there, that'd be one and a half persons all that's left in the church. What about Tulare? You know, all the churches around us, when this takes place, we'll be totally devastated. Now, on the way up, let me pose a question. If there was one and a half people left in Porterville, that's just using the text here, but if there's one and a half people left in Porterville, 
who do you think would pay church expenses? Who would pay the electric bill? Who would pay the taxes on the building? Wouldn't be the one and a half. It would probably be the 150. So I'm suggesting by the looks of things that God's people will join in home churches and little groups like this when the time comes. Uh, she made that statement in 1893 to the youth, and then 10 years later in 1902, she said not one in 100. One in 100. Uh, that's so devastating, I didn't want to mention it. <laughs> but, you know, you know, Brother John, we don't look at ourselves under that constraint, and we ought to. But here it's, it's, it's alluded to in Scripture in 1 Thessalonians. So I think we should be cognizant of it so when it happens, we won't fall apart. Because that's what this text is given for. It's given for God's people to hang in tight when this stuff goes on. And I think it will have that effect. I'd like to be preaching this to the whole church. Amen. I don't think I'd get through it. It wouldn't be because of a cough. <laughs> All right, the text goes on. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Yeah. Now, he hadn't changed his subject matter. He's still talking to the brethren of the end times. That they all might be damned who believe not what? The truth. The truth. We've got the truth. You know the truth. We, <laughs> we're developing the truth. We're looking at the truth. But the church isn't. And that's what it says. But it's hard to realize. They have part of it. 13th verse, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren. So he's still talking to the brothers. He's not talking to anybody else. He's doing this to encourage us in the end times before Christ comes, who's going to witness the falling away. Wow. You have to get out of the box to see it. Then it becomes plain. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. All right. Verse 14 and 15. We're getting down to the end of the chapter. Where unto he called you by our gospel to obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Stand fast. Hold traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Hang on to what you know is right, no matter if there ends up only being three of you. Amen. Be faithful. And he ends by saying, Amen. Amen. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Now, you might be surprised, but when I was south, I spent two and a half days on this Sabbath school class, <laughs> getting the slides and all that ready. So if you get a chance to review it, do so. There are so many keys in Revelation 13 for us. Um, even Daniel 7, that was mostly of the Dark Ages, even Daniel 7, uh, it ends up with the saints receiving the kingdom. It goes clear all the way through as, there, as though this time lapse of no tribulation didn't even hear counting. It goes all the way through to the end. Wow, what a powerful book we're studying. What a marvelous God we serve. And how good it is to have these opportunities to learn. <laughs>